Good morning, Grace Church. Uh, we know it's not ideal to uh, be giving the sermon this way, but uh, for now, in the midst of crazy times, we think this is the best way to continue feeding you spiritually. And so we hope that even though you are in your house, probably in your PJs, drinking your own homemade coffee, we hope you enjoy this time uh, with us today as we uh, continue to go through the Sermon on the Mount and ask Jesus to feed our souls, uh, even in trying and difficult seasons like this. So if you will, just pray with me, and uh, then we'll get started into uh, Matthew chapter 7 and the final sermon on the Sermon on the Mount. Father God, we thank you that even when we can't get together, that we're still the people of God. Father, that we're united by faith in Jesus, who's our King, that he reigns on the throne even now in the midst of our fears and in the midst of worldwide panic, Father, we know that you and Jesus are not panicking, and therefore we do not fear, and we have an unshakable confidence in Jesus alone. Father, we know that you are sovereign God, and so today we read the word, we study, we seek to apply, and to obey, and to worship, just as we always do, Father. Because, Father, even viruses cannot change the fact that we are sons and daughters of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And so, God, as we open up your word, I pray that you feed our souls, even though it's kind of a unique way and a unique time for us. I pray that you will help us uh, to benefit and to grow and to be filled with the words of Christ. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. I think it's best for us just to open up by reading the sermon text. If you're new with us online um, and you're just checking in for the first time, we've been going through sermon, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. And we're in the final stage, in the final section of Jesus' sermon to his people. And so we begin in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 13, which says this. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, and every diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree be bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the, into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day you will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Now, in recent days, news of the coronavirus has caused worldwide concern. More than ever, people are taking precautions. For example, in just one week, the sale of hand sanitizer shot through the roof at 313%. Everybody wants hand sanitizer, so much so that stores are out of stock because people are obsessed with keeping their hands clean. The news is flooded with pleas that people would wash their hands and stay at home if they're sick, that they would wear masks if they have coughs. They ask that we avoid people who show flu-like symptoms. Even seemingly normal errands like grocery shopping 
comes with a, lar- a great amount of hassle. People are aware of watching and being, and being aware of the people that are around them. You see people pulling out sanitizing wipes and cleaning down the shopping basket and opening up doors with tissues. And so people are showing at this time that they will do almost anything, pay almost anything, avoid almost anything to protect their physical health. If only we would apply the same commitment to our spiritual health while facing the dangers that threaten our discipleship. There are spiritual dangers, unseen spiritual viruses that threaten to weaken your walk with Christ. These spiritual dangers have a mortality rate that far exceeds any physical virus or any epidemic known to man. It has taken more lives than any plague that this world has ever known. Moreover, while the coronavirus is temporary and short-lived, these spiritual dangers have an eternal impact on your life. They can forever impact your relationship with God and with Jesus and your place in the presence of God. And so it is absolutely important, according to this final section in the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus' people be aware of the dangers that can hinder their health and vitality in their faith in Jesus. Jesus calls us to be disciples who flourish by being aware of the spiritual diseases that suck away a joyful relationship with the Savior. Now, consistent with the rest of the sermon, Matthew 7, 13 through 29 is a call to a sincere faith and a real discipleship, not some superficial external religiosity. Jesus wants your true devotion. Jesus wants your heart. Jesus wants your real faith. He doesn't just want your actions. He calls his people to not just avoid external adultery, not just to avoid sleeping with with other people, not just to avoid external acts of Uh, fornication. He wants his people to avoid and run from internal lust, to repent of our inward desires that cause us and lead us to do those things. He asks us, he tells us to not just pray and to give so that people will see, so that we can be applauded and respected among men for our public acts of holiness and godliness. He tells us to give in a way that's secret and in a way that only God will see. Well, in the same way, Jesus now warns us of four potential dangers that can keep us from having a real faith and a real, sincere, authentic walk with Jesus. He warns us about the dangers of broad roads, of false prophets, false confidence, and false foundations. And so we're going to work through each of these dangers in this final section of Matthew seven thirteen through 29. Jesus tells us about the first danger, beginning in verse 13 broad roads. He says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. According to Jesus, the road is broad. It has many lanes and wide shoulders. It's easygoing with few potholes and bumps. It's popular, filled with travelers from all walks of life. However, it's a road that leads to destruction. On the other hand, there's a road that's narrow. It doesn't have as many lanes. It is difficult. It's bumpy and gravelly. It's uncomfortable to go down. It has far less travelers, and more often than not, people question your sanity for taking it. And yet, that's the road that leads to life. Now, Jesus' description of life as a gate and as a road parallels the description of life in the book of Proverbs. If you've ever read the book of Proverbs, you're familiar with this two ways that, these two ways that Jesus is discussing here. For example, Solomon pleads with his readers saying, Do not enter the path or the way of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it and do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. But the way of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Now, Jesus' analogy of two roads also parallels Proverbs' analogy of two women, Lady Wisdom 
and the seductive, adulterous woman who symbolizes a life that is lived in foolishness, a life that chooses a way contrary to what God has revealed. Lady Wisdom beckons her hears with a sweet voice, Come to me, and I will, I will give you life. Come to me, and I will give you wisdom, and I will show you how to obey God. She's a faithful woman who walks by us and keeps us and guards us and gives us the life with God that we were intended to have. Proverbs says that she's a tree of life to anyone who clings to her. The adulterous woman, on the other hand, she speaks smooth words. She has a beautiful house. She's attractive. Many chase after her. But the road to her house leads to death. With much seductive speech, she persuades him, her victim. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once he follows her, as an ox goes to the slaughter, or a stag is caught fast till the arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. Jesus, like the sage of Proverbs, calls his people to wisdom. Just as the seductive woman's house leads to death, so also the broad road leads to destruction. Both are attractive. Both are easy. Both promise comfort. And both will steal away a person's life. Have wisdom to know which road you're on and where it's going. True, flourishing kingdom citizens... Do not choose broad and easygoing roads. They choose roads that lead to life, no matter how narrow, how difficult, and how unpopular it may be. Jesus' words tell us that there's only one way to life, and it's a difficult road. I think in his words, Jesus also tells us an implicit promise of marginalization. True Christian discipleship has never been mainstream. Jesus says in no uncertain terms that few follow the narrow road. I think ironically, the social marginalization that most Christians fear is the very thing that indicates that we're on the right path, that we're on the right road, that we're on this narrow road that few are going down. We should be more afraid of fitting comfortably into mainstream culture than we are of being pushed to the periphery of our postmodern world. And so when we are pushed to the side, when you're at your job and you're one of the minority because of your faith in Christ, when you go to school and you're in the minority because of what you believe about Jesus, when you're in your family and you're one of the few who trust in Jesus alone and nothing else, take heart. Jesus was pushed to the side too. Jesus was on the margins. And what's more, Jesus has promised to meet us in the margins and to care for his narrow road followers, his narrow road travelers, those who travel the road that few will go down. It may look dim and dark at present, but according to Proverbs, the way of the righteous will shine brighter and brighter until Christ brings the full day of his kingdom. Now, practically, this means we must be aware of charting our discipleship based on what everyone else is doing. Spiritual interstate highways lead off cliffs. Spiritual interstate highways lead to massive wrecks and mass destruction. Spiritual interstate highways lead to your death. What road you are following and why you are taking it is incredibly crucial to your walk with Christ. So, I think it's worth asking, what road are you going down? And are you taking it because it's the way most people are going? This is what most people do. This is what most of the world is going, the way most of the world is going. Do you choose it because it's the way that God has given? Or do you choose it because it's the popular, easy way? Do you make your doctrinal positions based on what most people believe? Or do you do the hard work that few are willing to do and go to God's word and build your doctrine Build what you believe about God and about the world and about sin based on what God's word says. My friends, we've got to be careful of taking the path of least resistance. We've got to be careful to be committed to the road that leads to life, even if it leads down sorrows and hardships, even if we get flat tires because of the potholes, even if the narrow shoulder threatens to push us into the ditch. God will keep us safe on the narrow road. He keeps his people. He does not lose one of them. 
So, when you're faced with the broad road that leads to comfort, but that also leads to condemnation, and then the narrow road of crucifixion that leads to resurrection, healthy, thriving disciples embrace the cross and they carry it up the difficult road to be with their Lord, to die with Him in a death like His so that they can be raised with Him in a resurrection like His. Broad and easy roads inevitably lead you away from Christ. The second danger we must be aware of is that of false prophets. Jesus commands His listeners, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. I think sometimes as modern readers, we read this and we're like, okay, we're going to really doubt this a little bit. Are there really people out there who desire to devour our faith? Are there really people out there who are motivated by the thought of leading us away from Jesus and leading us away from life? Are there really people out there, whether they know it or not, who are seeking to destroy your joy that has been given to you in Jesus alone? Well, Jesus says plainly, yes. There are all kinds of people that are out just for your destruction of joy. Whether they know it or not, they are stealing you away from the only Savior who can bring you life, who can bring you satisfaction. I think it's worth asking here, what is a false prophet? According to Jesus' own analogy, these are people who come with soft wool and sharp teeth. Soft wool and sharp teeth. On the surface, they look and act godly. You may not, you may not be able to tell them from us. You may not be able to tell a false prophet from a sincere believer just based on their superficial life. They look like one of God's own sheep, but their intent is to ravage and to destroy God's flock. They desire to destroy other people's faith in Jesus rather than building it up. Now, if you go to the Old Testament, prophets were people who were designated to deliver a message from God. They were people who were to teach God's people how to live in light of God's revealed, declared will. They were God's spokesmen, God's representatives. So, by that, in that, by, by that line of thinking, we can see that false prophets are those who spoke falsehoods and claimed that they were from God. They were those who were false representatives of what God said. They spoke and claimed that they were God's words, when in reality, God had never even said such things. And if you do an even deeper study of what old, the Old Testament says about false prophets, you see that these false prophets tend to be people who only speak good and happy messages. In, 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 for example, in 1 Kings chapter 22, the false prophets are those who are telling King Ahab, everything's going to be okay. You're good. God is on your side. God is not angry with your sin. There is no judgment coming. You are good with God. And yet the real prophet is the one who is warning that God is a holy God and that he will judge sin. False prophets placate to what people want to hear. In Isaiah chapter 30, 10, God's people, the, the people of Israel say, Do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. They want to hear good things. They want to hear good news. Don't tell us the bad news about sin. Don't tell us the bad news that God is holy. Don't tell us the bad news that we stand in the judgment of God. Tell us that we're good with God as we are Without repentance, we want to continue in our own way. We want to continue doing what we want to do, and yet we don't want there to be any consequences. Tell us that message. Tell us that God loves us and continues to love us and will bless us even while we're sinning against Him. I do think God loves us even when we're sinning against Him. But false prophets speak about blessing without obedience. They speak of blessing without traveling down a road that leads to life. These are people who have, according to Paul, smooth talk and flattery. They flatter you, and they deceive the hearts of the naive, according to Romans 16, 18. These are people who bolster your confidence in yourself. They lessen your dependence on God. They preach messages like, go wash your face, go clean yourself up, make yourself better, get a Get a better self-confidence. Trust in your self-image. Be happy with yourself. Fill yourself up with self-esteem. They speak and lull you into sleep with smooth words of comfort. 
instead of calling you into dependence on God, instead of calling you to trust in the only one who can wash you of your sin, instead of calling you to see that you are not strong enough in and of yourself, that you should not esteem yourself, but you should esteem, esteem Christ who stands on your behalf, that you should trust in Him, that you should believe in, in His words, that you should come to Him for any sense of security, not in your own strength, in your own skill. Now, if these false prophets come as wolves in sheep's clothing, what hope do we have of recognizing them? Well, Jesus answers, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every tree that bears good, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Jesus tells us not only to listen to a person's words or to just take them at their word, but instead we're to inspect their fruit. Fruit describes the, the results or the natural consequences of a person's life. He says, look to their fruits. Look at the consequences of how they live and what they say. So, for example, a person can say they know Jesus and they can say they have the Holy Spirit, but Paul tells us to look for the fruits of what? The, of the Spirit, the results of the Spirit's indwelling presence in their life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Without those fruits, we have no confidence that we have the Holy Spirit. Those fruits are demonstrations, evidences that the Spirit is indeed working in our lives. If the Spirit is in us, then we will inevitably increase in love. If the Spirit is in us, then we will inevitably have increasing joy and peace and patience. And so we're looking to the results, to the fruit of people's lives. In the Old Testament, a prophet's validity was proven through signs. If what he said happened, came true, then it, he was a true prophet. If he prophesied something and it didn't happen, then he was to be a false prophet. He was to be stoned and thrown out of Israel. And yet... We have false prophets still working in our days. They claim to speak the word of God as they tell us that he grants immediate prosperity to those he loves. To those who love him and obey him, he will give them health, he'll give them wealth, and he'll give them long life and prosperity in this world. They discredit the holiness of God by claiming that God will simply overlook sin. These prophets pump us full of self-confidence. And they say, yes, you can right now wash yourself clean. Yes, you can right now make yourself better. And yet, all they're doing is flattering us by making us think that our hard work can be of effect. And yet, what's the, what's the fruit? What happens when a coronavirus hits the nation and suddenly we find out the prosperity gospel is nothing? That people who love and try to obey God still get sick with viruses. What happens when we try and try and try to wash ourselves clean? We try to make ourselves better. We do self-improvement plans. We buy self-help books, and yet we still feel sinful and shameful. No matter how much we wash our face, we still feel as if the stains of sin are covering us. Beware of the fruits. Look at their fruits. You will know them by their fruits. No matter how much you do, it is not enough to make yourself clean before God and the holy God of the universe. Jesus warns that these false prophets are diseased trees that bear diseased fruit. And diseased trees and bad fruit will inevitably lead to judgment and fruitlessness. They're out to make you stop producing fruit by faith. They're out to take away your ability to bear fruit to the glory of God. And Jesus warns, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. It's extremely important for Christians to know and test the fruits of those who claim to speak on God's behalf. Does their fruit lead to life? Or is the fruit rotten? A third danger disciples must avoid, is that of false confidence. He says this, 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus makes a distinction between superficial affirmation that Jesus is Lord and a sincere commitment to that truth. According to him, simply acknowledging that Jesus is Lord will not do. We must do the will of the Father. But what's the Father's will? God's will is that people will know Jesus. That means that they will have a, an authentic relationship with the Son of God. Jesus warns, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Listen to them listing out their works. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Listen to what the people standing before Jesus on Judgment Day are saying. They call Jesus Lord. So here we have an intellectual consent that Jesus is king. They then go on to list all the good things that they have done in his name. They have prophesied, cast out demons, done many, many mighty works. And on a surface level, I think we would be standing there listening to these people and going, yes, those people are a shoe in Those people certainly are getting into the kingdom of God. Look at all that they've done in Jesus' name. And still, Jesus commands them to depart and even goes so far to call them workers of lawlessness. At the center of Jesus' rebuke is the, state, is the statement, I never knew you. In reality, these people who are standing before Jesus, claiming him as Lord and at the same time listing out all their works, are clinging to a Jesus plus type of confidence. Their hope is in the fact that they can call Jesus Lord plus all the many things that they have done. However, I think if we listen to the, to the words of Scripture, eternity never hinges on what we have done in His name. Eternity hinges not on our intellectual consent that Jesus is Lord. Eternity hinges only on whether or not we know Jesus and Jesus knows us, not know about Jesus, not do things for Jesus, but know Jesus. Now, to know someone describes a deep, personal, intimate relationship with them. As the entire sermon has shown, true righteousness exceeds merely external works. True righteousness is always centered on the heart and one's relationship with the Savior. Jesus affirms this in John 17, 3 when he prays, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's eternal life. Eternal life is not something that we can gain by doing a lot of good things. It's a gift to those who know Jesus as their only Savior and those who trust in him only and don't come with a list of things that they have done and don't come in confidence that they have done enough good deeds to get into heaven. They come only in confidence of Jesus. Anything less than having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is considered lawlessness. This means that even our best deeds, even your best righteous acts, without a sincere and authentic relationship with Jesus, are repulsive in God's eyes. Tithing, without knowledge of Christ, an intimate knowledge of Christ, is lawlessness. Doing many mighty works without a knowledge of Jesus Christ is lawlessness. On the final day, we have no other confidence than the truth that we know the Son through faith. We can hope in nothing else, cling to nothing else, trust in nothing else. All else, even our works, are broken reeds that will snap if we lean on them. So, in what do you place your confidence? If someone were to ask you, how do you know that you have eternal life, how would you answer? Would you cite the fact that you are a generally good-natured person? That you are decent and moral, that you, you do many good things, and you avoid all the big transgressions that everybody else does? Would you cite the fact that you, you know, you've gone to church in the last few years? Or that you do lots 
of religious things or that you know a lot about Jesus or that you read your Bible every morning or that you pray before every meal? Would you start listing out all these good and righteous things that you do? And if so, then you are holding and clinging on to a false confidence, a confidence that will be shattered on the final day. In the words of an old hymn, true hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We have eternity only if we know the Son, and knowing Him means trusting Him. Jesus took the burden of my sin. I do not have to wash myself. I do not have to clean my face. I do not have to try to wash my hands. Jesus has taken the burden of sin and guilt that I was unable to bear. He washed the stains I was unable to wash. He took my cross, my shame, and the wrath that was reserved for me, the bitter cup of judgment that was mine, and for me to drink the dregs of God's wrath was poured out on Him instead of me. He suffered and died in agony. He was buried in a tomb. The stone covered the entrance. And then three days later, he rose again and now lives as my guarantee that my eternal place in the presence of God is secure in him. In what do I have confidence? In nothing else but the fact that Jesus is my Savior, my righteousness, that my sins have been covered by his atoning death. This I know, and on this rock I stand. Healthy, flourishing, mature, thriving kingdom citizens have a confidence in knowing Jesus alone. Now, the final danger that Jesus tells us we must avoid for the sake of our spiritual health and flourishing is the danger of false foundations. In the final verses, Jesus speaks of two types of people. First, there are people who hear his words and do them. Everyone then who hears these words of mine And does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it has been founded on the rock. And then he speaks of a second group who hear his words but don't do them. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now, notice that both groups hear Jesus' words. In the analogy, both groups are building a house. Both groups face the same rains, the same floods, and the same winds. But only the wise man's house stands in the end. The difference between a house that stands when the flood waters of judgment come, and a house that falls is whether or not that person lives on the word of Christ, the rock. True wisdom is not just being a hearer of the word, but being a doer of the word as well. Jesus' teaching is meant to have a real impact on our lives. If he truly is our king, then his word must be effective and authoritative in our lives. Wise builders... People who seek to build their life in wisdom, build on solid foundations. And truly wise disciples build their lives on the words of Christ. What good is it to read God's word, to quote God's word, to listen to sermons, if we do not submit our hearts to obey the words we read, quote, and hear? Christ's teaching is meant to shape you. And to form you. It's meant to transform you into his image. Jesus' metaphor of, of, of a storm comes with a sense of urgency. The storm of God's final day is coming. The judgment is coming. Even the image of floodwaters echoes the sudden flood that came in Genesis 6. People weren't expecting it and suddenly it came. So there's an urgency to make sure that we are building our lives on the rock, not to wait till someday, not to wait till uh, uh, someday when we're older, not to wait till the coronavirus is gone, but to build our lives on the word of Christ right now. This is why even right now when we can't do a gathered church, we still remain centered on the word of God, 
This is why we are so emphatic on getting the sermon into your house, onto your TV, or onto your computer when we can't get together because of the virus. Because we believe that we must be people who build our lives on the rock, and even so much more now. This is what we are called to do. And without building our lives on the Word of Christ, without building our lives on the rock, we are building lives on, stand, on sand that will eventually fall, and great will be the fall of a life not built on Christ. Now, to end the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew writes this, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, and not as their scribes. Now, these verses remind us why Matthew has recorded the Sermon in the, on the Mount in the first place. Namely, Matthew reminds us that Jesus is the son of David, the king. To him, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given. To him alone belongs the throne of David forever and ever. He is the eternal, righteous king who will last beyond all other kings. All other kings bow to him. All other lords bow to him. All other kingdoms fall to his kingdom. He is the eternal king. And this is demonstrated by his authoritative teaching. This means that this entire series on the Sermon on the Mount that we have done, these last seven or eight weeks that we have gone through Jesus' words on the Mount, is meant to call us to trust in Jesus as King, to submit to Him, to worship Him, to bow the knee to Him, to give up our own reign as kings. We are not kings. We are not sovereign. All authority has not been given to us. We do not wear the eternal crown. Jesus alone does. And so, here we are called to be healthy, flourishing kingdom citizens. To be trees that are planted by streams of living water that yield fruit in season and out of season. To have leaves that do not wither. To be fruit trees in the desert. To thrive in this world of exile. To thrive in this world of discomfort and suffering to thrive in a world filled with coronavirus. Even right now, when people are getting sick, are struggle, struggling with the flu, are struggling with fever, are having to stay quarantined, even right now, we can flourish as God's people by obeying Jesus as King. And so my prayer is that even today, from the safety of your house and the comfort of your living room, with your warm coffee in hand, that you and your family will live knowing that Jesus alone is the eternal King. And to Him alone belongs all glory forever and ever. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray for the, these people that are watching. God, I thank you that they have woken up to come and join us in worship. Father God, we are separated in body, but we're united in spirit, God. We sing one song. We surround ourselves against one word, and we serve one Lord and Master and King. And we worship you, the one true Father of all. We love you. We thank you for saving us. We pray that in this time of fear, that you will save others by showing them that you are the only confidence that we can have, the only rock who will stand. Everything else is sand. You alone will last forever. We pray this in the name of your only Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.